Father, we thank you for the prayers that have been prayed. We thank you for the songs that have been sung. We thank you for an opportunity to worship you and give you. And now as we get into the word, we ask that it will fall upon the good soil of our hearts. And that, it, that it will grow and become a mighty oak in our minds, our hearts, and our spirits. We thank you and we honor you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, we are into our fifth and final episode of our series entitled Dysfunctional. Old stories, same problems. This is, again, our fifth and final episode because one of the greatest Sundays of the year is next Sunday. Father's Day, just in case y'all didn't know. All right. So with that being said, let's go ahead and jump into this fifth episode of this series. Our starting statement is this. Jacob blessed his children and grandchildren as God's promise continues to be fulfilled. We should not give up on people. What has been broken can be mended. And we're going to get into this whole situation of how things can happen that can cause complications. If you remember in episode number one, the subtopic title was In Spite of Me. Episode number two was called Bless This Mess. Episode number three, we talked about the legacy change. Last week, we talked about the name change. And then our final episode, episode number five, we are going to be discussing the promise keeper. The promise keeper. Our definitions are, number one, Dysfunctional. Dysfunction is abnormal or unhealthy interpersonal behavior or interaction within a group. Our second definition is promise. In general, it's a declaration written or verbal made by one person to another which binds the person who makes it to do or to forbear to do. We are, or we have come to this point whereby we are finishing up this series. And we have gone from Abram all the way now, we are going into Joseph. Joseph, um, in case you didn't know, was the firstborn of Jacob's favorite wife. He was, even though he was the 12th born child, he was the number one child in his father's eyes. This caused some complications with the other 11 or ten brothers, and it doesn't say how his sister felt, but it caused some complications. And so when we look at this, we can see how the situation that we're in came to pass. Because Jacob didn't hide the fact that he thought so much of Joseph. Joseph didn't hide the fact that he knew what God had purpose for him. There was a time they were getting ready for breakfast and Joseph says, I had a dream last night and we were all sitting out gathering up uh, the wheat and our wheat stalks all stood up and mine stood up, the, up, tall, up tall and all yours bowed down to mine. little smart alley. And then a couple days later he says, I had another dream. And they, he said, 
My star was the brightest of the stars, and the sun and the moon and all the other stars bowed down to my star. Jacob said, are you trying to say that I'm going to bow down to you too? So he was excited about what he was seeing and thought everybody since he was the favorite that everybody would like what he had to say. But as you go through the story of Joseph, you discover that that ain't all true. Joseph gets himself in a very precarious situation as he goes to take care of his brothers as directed by his father. And the reason his father would send Joseph to go take care of his brothers is because Joseph, being the favorite, would come back and tell everything. Yes. And so he, they send him and they say, oh, here comes the dreamer. And they decided, conspired to kill him. But the number one son, officially, Reuben, decided, no, let's just scare him a little bit. Let's just scare him a little bit. So they beat him up a little bit, throw him in a hole, and they're going to leave him in the hole. Uh, but Reuben said, let's put him in the hole because he's going to come back later and get him. Well, Reuben went off, and a caravan that was heading to Egypt comes through, and they sold Joseph to the caravan. They find a goat and put the goat's blood on his coat, that his special coat, a coat of many colors, because he stood out from the rest of the family. He was considered the prince of the family. And they put the blood on his coat and took it back to Jacob and said, a wild animal must have gotten our brother and your son. However, he was in a situation where he went to Egypt and God was with him and he worked for a man and then he got thrown in prison and when he got to the prison, the, the prison guard said, you are such a good person, I'm going to put you in charge of all the prisoners and it worked out till it finally ends up that Jacob, I mean, uh, uh, Joseph becomes the governor of Egypt. He's the second in command in Egypt. Egypt. He is so beloved by Pharaoh, Pharaoh goes to the high priest and tells the high priest to give his wife, uh, his daughter to Joseph to be his wife. Je Joseph is running business and a famine comes through the land and there's a whole, I could talk for about 20 more minutes just about to get us to the scriptures we're trying to get to, but uh, the famine comes into the land. And when the famine comes, Jacob has to send his sons to go and to get some food because it's a famine in the land. Now this note, let's note this, that this time this famine did not cause God to intervene like he did before. They had to go through the process just like everybody else is around them because God in the end had a greater blessing for them even in the midst of their nonsense and craziness. And so we get here and we find out as they go through all this of dealing with Joseph and Joseph realizing that it's his brothers and everything and he finally reconciles his entire family. Jacob is made happy and the Pharaoh says whatever Jacob wants, wherever part of the land Jacob wants to live in, he can live wherever he wants to live and he picks Gosham and so that's where the family stays. Now as they're living there and they're enjoying life and everything's going well, jo jo uh, Jacob gets a little bit old and it's time for jo Jacob to cross over to the other side. And here we come to Genesis, the 40th chapter, starting at the first verse. And it says, after this, Joseph was told, behold, your father is ill. So he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And it was told to Jacob, your son Joseph has come to you. Then Israel summoned his strength and sat up in bed. And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luce in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, I, Behold, I will make you fruitful 
and multiply you, and I will make of you a company of peoples, and will give this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting possession. And now you, now, and now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine as Reuben and Simeon are. Now, if you did not know, Reuben and Simeon are his first two born sons. But now he's going to replace them two with his favorite son's sons. Just throw that in there. And the children that you fathered after them shall be yours. It don't say nothing about Joseph having any other children. He said, any other children are yours. Oh, I'm not going to do the whole commentary. They shall be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. As for me, when I came from Padan, to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan on the way. While there was still some distance to go to Ephrath, and I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, who are these? Joseph said to his father, these are my sons who God has given me here. And he said, bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age, so he could not see. So Joseph brought them near him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face. And behold, God has let me see your offspring also. Amen. Then Joseph removed from them from his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my father Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys. And in them let my name be carried on in the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac. And let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the hand of Ephraim, it displeased him, and he took his father's hand and moved it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not this way, my father. Since this one is the firstborn, put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. Nevertheless, the younger brother shall be greater than he, and his offspring shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will pronounce blessings, saying, God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. Thus he put Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I'm about to die, but God will be with you and will bring you again to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you rather than to your brothers one mountain slope that I took from the hands of, Amor of the Amorites, with my sword and my bow. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask you to bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so what we have here is the fact that when God does his promises, because he is a promise keeper, he promised Abram, who became Abraham. He promised Jacob, I mean it, Isaac, who meant, his name meant God laughs. He said uh, Jacob, who meant deceiver to Israel, the prince of God, he kept his promise through every generation. Even though it looked like the promise was not going to happen, and traditionally it is the firstborn who gets this special blessing of, of, of extra but if you look at how things happen in Abram's timeline, Isaac was the second born. If you look at how things happen, Jacob was the second born. Now, 
really, as I said before, I, uh, Joseph was the firstborn of the woman that he loved. But if you really look at it, he really down the line because he was the twelfth born. But when he looked at Joseph, he says, Joseph, you are my son. However, I'm taking your sons and making them my sons, which means that he, the blessing that you are going to get, I'm going to make sure it goes to another generation. So he says, the same thing is going to happen. And it said, Joseph got an attitude. <laughs> that ain't the firstborn, Pops. That ain't the firstborn. He said, I know what I'm doing. Because the secondborn... Because it's this trend that God's working that traditionally in the land of the Near East of that time, the firstborn got the more. But in God's situation, because he's a promise keeper, he does things differently. He set it up so it ain't the firstborn. The firstborn is going to be blessed. If you remember when Isaac... I mean, when Jacob, Israel went back to meet up with Esau, Esau said, I don't need your stuff. I've been blessed. But still, yes. Isaac, I mean, Israel still was the more blessed. So when God is working this thing out, it doesn't happen the way tradition happens. In the midst of their dysfunction. Now, how dysfunctional were Israel's children. They were so dysfunctional that they not only had they planned to kill their baby brother, but then they sold him and played it off like something else happened to him, causing their daddy to feel like he lost his child. And so as we look at this, we see how God is faithful throughout this entire situation. He has set it up and positioned it so that when we look at, even in the midst of our dysfunction, God still has his hand in our lives. Yes. God still is orchestrating his plan in the midst of our lives. Sometimes it's going to require us to laugh at what God says, but we still remain faithful as it happened with Abraham. Some of us are going to have to be offered as a sacrifice in order for God to prove that even when we're showing how much we love him, that he can provide another way to prove to us that he's still the promise keeper as he did with Isaac. Some of us, he has to take us to a place where we can see somebody that's a little bit more devious than us and put us in our place and then bring us to a point where we wrestle with him so that he causes us to change as we go forward. Yes, yes. Remember, Jacob still had that limp. Jake, that, that limp didn't leave. He's still, he still, he old and limpy now. But it's still going on. And it, and it goes on to now Joseph, who we will find out if, if you continue to read the story. Once, once um, Israel died, the brothers said, well, now the dad's gone. And he's so powerful, we finna die. But let's tell Joseph that dad said that he's supposed to forgive us. And that so that way we won't get ourselves in trouble. But the thing was, because God spoke to jo Joseph, he told them what their brothers was con contriving. And he goes and he says, listen, don't y'all come up here with that nonsense lying about what dad said. He said, what you thought to be for my evil, God flipped it for my good. And so we have to realize that even in the midst of the dysfunction that we're going through, that God is still working out something yes. for us. Amen. But the wheels fell off the car. Maybe it's time that God is opening up opportunity for you to get a new vehicle. Okay. We have to believe and have confidence that God is working this out for our good and for his glory. Yes. 
And if we realize that, then God becomes the keeper of the promises. God becomes the, uh, the integrity of our situation. God becomes a man after his word. I told this story before. Um, I am a person, I believe that a man's word is his bond. I, I've always believed it. That's something that's just been ingrained in me. Uh, it's part of my DNA. And I remember in second grade, I, I said a smart remark to a guy, and he said, your mama. And I told him, I said, I'm going to beat you up for the rest of this week because you talked about my mama. Now, he probably didn't think it, was gonna it wasn't going to happen but just that day. But that was like a Tuesday. No, it was a Monday if I remember correctly. So he got beat up Monday. No, it was a Tuesday because he got beat up on Tuesday. Then I chased him home on Wednesday and beat him up. Chased him home on Thursday and beat him up. Chased him home on Friday. Then I caught him before he got out the playground on Friday. I beat him up again. It became a little school thing because they just thought I was going to beat him up for the rest of the... But you shouldn't have been talking about my mom. Well, anyway, that Monday when I got to school, because I told him this is your last day that you're going to get beat up. And I'm a person of my word. And, but as I was sitting in my classroom, I don't forget because I got called down to the principal's office. And guess who was sitting in the principal's office? The principal. Guess who else was sitting there? My mama. That was a bunch of mess. But anyway, so I'm sitting in the principal's office because the you know, crybaby was sitting there. Mama done called the principal talking about her son getting beat up. I wasn't beating him up bad, just enough so that... But anyway, so I get called in the principal's office. And the principal explaining to my mom what's going on. And mom said, don't beat the boy up because I don't even know what he said. Anyway, it's not true. She used to always tell us that. If it's not true, why are you worrying about it? I, it's just, I, say, I said, I'm going to beat him up, so that's what was going to happen. Anyhow, even after all that, this is what my mom said. She said, I know what you're thinking, and I already just told you. Do not beat that boy up today. Because I had already told him. And if she would not have threatened, I, I'm sorry, if she would not have encouraged me not <laughs> to go ahead and override what I said, then he's going to get beat up another day. I probably got suspended. But anyway, but that's how God is. If God says, I am going to do, even in the midst of how crazy a situation may look, even though how contrary to what God says it looks, are you going to trust the, comp, the, uh, the environment? Are you going to trust the uh, situation? Or are you going to trust the God that is greater than the situation? Now, I know what we want to say. We want to say, I'm going to trust God. But when you're in the midst of that situation, I just want to encourage you that the Bible did not just put this, uh, David did not just put this as a psalm just for no reason. It's because he was going through situations. And when he was going through situations, he says that I will look to the hills, which meant he had to look up. And he would not look at the situation, but he would look above the situation. It says, I will look to the hills from which cometh my help. Because my help does not come from my situation. It comes from the Lord who created the heavens and the earth. And so that's the same type of situation that we have to look at. Even though we can look back this Thousands of years at the Abraham family, and we can see how there are situations in our lives, in our families, where brothers and sisters don't like each other. They don't get along because the baby is being favored, and, and they really want to do something to them, but they know if they do something to them, they're going to get in trouble. And You know, it's all this. But if we trust that God is working something in our situation, Amen. if we believe and trust that he is doing something, 
through the midst of all this, the baby may become the person that becomes the deliverer for the entire family like he did with Joseph. All the babies, all the family babies is raising up saying, yeah, all right. But we have to get the idea. We have to realize that God is orchestrating this like a symphony. That he knows when everything is supposed to happen. We only know what's happening in our section, but God has the whole orchestra under his control. And so we look at how this happens. This, even how this blessing in Joseph's life didn't even happen the traditional way. He comes in and say, tell, say goodbye to his father. He brings his sons so they can see. And he like, get out the way, Joseph. I want to talk to your sons because they're now my sons. What kind of? I thought I was a favorite. No, uh, well, get, let, me, let me bless. It didn't say let me pray for you. I'm going to lay hands on your sons and speak a blessing over your sons. Because that, but that's not how it usually goes. And then he says, he said, so Joseph says, okay, if you're going to bless my sons, here's my firstborn. I'm going to put him over your right hand. I'm going to give you my younger son over your left hand. And the old man who can't see crossed his arms over. <laughs> well, dad's kind of blind. You know, he's hobbling. Let me help him out. No, dad, let me, I know what I'm doing. You, I, you know, I, I, Every time I read it, I think of how the old, old folks today be like, well, I know what I'm doing. You ain't got to tell me. He knew what he was doing. He was doing what God had revealed to him was the proper way to go. He did not have to. Joseph didn't have to come in and, and wear uh, fur. And he didn't have to be deceitful. He didn't have to do anything. All he had to do was present his sons and uh, Israel knew exactly what needed to happen. And so he was able to say, because Joseph, because of God using you to deliver our family, to do all these things, I have a special area in the land that I want to bless you with. And because of all this, we can see that God keeps his promise. Abraham is in the ground. Abraham has turned to dust. And we can still see how God is going on keeping the promise. Just like when Jesus said, I got to go away, but I'm coming back. He didn't say it just to be saying something. That is a promise. He says, but I will not leave you without any assistance. I'm going to send the comforter to be with you. And he's going to lead you to all truth. And so the promise in the midst of this function is that there is truth that's going to be available to you in the midst of all the dysfunction. Of all the confusion, all that you're going through, there is going to be truth that is going to lead you and guide you, establish you, and put you in a position so that the promise of, of, of God, which as we said before, which are yes and amen, they're going to happen, that we can receive. I know you, some of us are feeling as if I, I, am, I am lower. It, it, I am so low that I can step up on a dime. But God still has you. God still knows what he's working. God still knows what you need. God is maneuvering situations on your behalf. There was a song that says all we have to do is trust him. Him only. You can depend on him. Trust him. Him only. You can depend on him. You can depend that even in the midst of what you're going through, Joseph is in a, in, in a high 
high uh, public figures house and he's now he's in prison but he still trusted that God was working something out in him and next thing he knows is that God puts him the second in command of one of the greatest nations at the time and everybody has to come to Joseph Pharaoh said the only person that you ain't in charge of is me you in charge of everything else. And he said, told everybody, Joseph in charge. Put him in, his, put him in the chariot and let Joseph follow behind him. And they proclaimed that Joseph is in charge. And then it comes to the time when what all this happened for was so that Jacob, Israel, would be delivered in the time of famine. God has it all worked out. So as we're coming to the close of this dysfunctional, old stories, the same problems, we could do like uh, some of the, some of the uh, old TV crime shows. They say the names have been changed to protect the innocent. We could change some of these names, and Abraham could be your great-grandparent, and uh, Isaac could be your grandparent, and uh, Jacob could be your father. Uh, uh, it, 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 could, it could change. The names could change because all families have this level of dysfunction that they have to work through. Yes. But if you trust in the Lord, yes. Him only, you can depend on him that he will turn your crying into laughter. He will change your weeping into excitement. God will work out things for you. And even, you know, we can even get like the Hebrew boys. And even if he does it in my time frame, I still trust that he is able. He's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above whatever I can ask or think according to the power, the comforter that works in us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So as we celebrate the fact that God is the promise keeper, any promise that he makes, he's going to keep it. There's nothing that can stop God from keeping his promises. Even when we try to self-sabotage, he still finds a way to make the promise come to pass because God is a promise keeper. Hold on. Hold on to the promise that God has given you. And even in the midst of how dysfunctional the situation may look, God is able. God is able. God is able. They say whatever might be impossible for man is not impossible for God. With that being said, I just want to close with this. That if you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your dysfunction can seem overwhelming. Your dysfunction can seem never ending. The situation just can just look so bleak and you can feel that everything around you is pressing and depressing and pushing you further and further down and away. But I want to tell you, even in the midst of that, God can work something out for your good and his glory. I'm not trying to be up here and tell you that if you accept Jesus, that everything's going to go away and the yellow brick road's going to come out and you're just going to be able to skip right along the way. But what I'm telling you is when Jesus comes into your life, when you accept him and make him not only Savior but Lord of your life, that in the midst of whatever you're going through, 
You have confidence, you have hope, and you know that something in this situation is going to give God glory and he's going to turn it for your good. But without hope, it is impossible for us to continue to go on. That's right, that's right. And Jesus in your life will manifest hope in your life. And the process of accepting Jesus is not complicated. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Because if you believe in your heart, you are made right with God. And with your mouth, you are saved. Saved means to be rescued and delivered. And you're rescued and delivered from the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if that has been your decision today, that you want the Lord in your life, and you have called upon the name of the Lord, you have began the process of salvation. The initial process is to rescue you, deliver you from the penalty of sin. The next process is to sanctify you or to cause you to begin to walk in a way that reflects God in your life. And the final way is that he will remove you from the very presence of sin by bringing you up into his kingdom. And we want to assist you along that journey. And in order for us to assist you, we need to know that you need our assistance. So please let us know by emailing us at info at godshousecc.com and we will ensure to come alongside you to assist you along this journey. It is our hope and our privilege that you will not look at this as an individual sport, but as a team sport where we all come together as a team to help one another along this journey. With that being said, info at godshousecc.com is the email. Let us know and we will come right alongside you. All right? Friends and family, dysfunctional, old stories, same problem is in the books. Thank you for going along this journey with us. We hope and we pray. In fact, we know that something was said that is an encouragement to you. And we want you to continue to go on in Jesus' name, lifting him higher and higher in your life, your conduct, and your mentality, that people will be drawn to him, that he will be glorified. Well, until next week, God's blessings be upon you in Jesus' name.